Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey, the Bulletproof Executive. Today's cool fact of the day is that some people's sweat doesn't stink. It turns out you have a gene called ABCC11, and it decides whether or not you're going to make wet earwax or dry earwax. And what's kind of interesting there is that the earwax type you have determines whether you're going to have a certain chemical in your armpits that bacteria eat. And, well, that's what's going to cause the bad smell in your armpits. So if you have dry earwax, you're lucky because you probably don't have BO. And if you're searching for a prospective mate, maybe those with dry earwax are going to be more attractive because they don't stink. On today's show, four-time CrossFit Games individual competitor and head trainer owner of a different kind of CrossFit gym is on board. We're talking about CrossFit East Decatur, run by Shana Alverson, and we're going to talk about how women exercise, paleo lifestyle, and kicking ass in general. Shana, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Dave. You got it. I, uh, I'm having a little trouble getting past the uh, earwax part of the intro. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know you want to stick your finger in and look right now to see what kind of earwax you have, don't you? Uh, I already know. I'm familiar <laughs> with my own earwax, okay? <laughs> I already never, know. I've never actually like judged whether mine's wet or dry, because how would I know since I've never like felt anyone else's earwax? Like, ah, so you have no point of reference, is what you're saying. <laughs> ex ex I might think it's dry, but it's kind of wet, right? Like, how would I know? And certainly, I I never smell, so I must have the dry kind, right? Oh, you never sm I smell all the time. I, I'm just I'm keeping it real, man. I'm I work just saying, out I never smell. For a living. So. <laughs> I, one thing I, I, know I, can, I, I I didn't think we'd really, you know, hit on body odor as our first kind of topic here, but I can tell you, since I started really eliminating those trace toxins from my diet. Like, I don't get BO. Like, it really takes days and days. And if I get it, it's because I ate something and I can usually tell you what it was that gave me BO. Like, it, it's really weird to just, like, not stink. But I don't think that's earwax gene related. Huh. But you just stink. I, I, I wish I could. I wish I could say when I cleaned up my diet, I didn't stink as much. But maybe it's because I went from old school working out in the air conditioned Globo gym and now. You know, the, it's kind of a CrossFit thing that there's no climate control in your environment. So in the mm -hmm. summertime, it's like, all, it's, yeah. It's well, sweaty. plus you, you live in Georgia, right? So, yeah. I mean, it is hot and wet in Georgia. Oh, my God. Yeah, they call it, I live in Atlanta, essentially. So, hot Atlanta is it's pretty accurate. <laughs> Wow. Uh, the few times I've been to Atlanta, I've always been uh, just amazed that you step out of the airplane and you're like, am I in Atlanta or am I walking on someone's tongue? Because it's just like yeah. the moisture in the air is like so wet. Uh, that, yeah, there's not very many good hair days during the summer. <laughs> Throw that out there. Well, when you have bright blue hair, every day is a good hair day, isn't it? <laughs> you think. You think. <laughs> And by the way, if, if you're listening in your car, Shana has this intense blue hair that's very superhero looking. I'm just trying to channel my inner Wonder Woman. And, and like super ripped arms too. Oh, we well, can't even see my arms. I can see your shoulders. Well, there. Now we can see your arms. <laughs> even better. No, you've been doing CrossFit since 2007. So you're like old school CrossFit. What got you into it so early? Ooh, um, well, I, we would have to back up probably. I started exercising super young, um, lifting weights. I joined a gym when I was in my early teens. I don't even think I was old enough to drive myself to the gym yet. Um, you're like mid, you're mid thirties now, right? So this is like 20 years ago you joined a gym. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm 37. Okay. Uh, I'll be 38 in May. And, uh, I started exercising at a gym roughly around 14 or 15 um and it was my basically my parents sat me down and they were like hey kind of you're fat so <laughs> we want you to lose weight uh and that just kind of started this lifelong journey of mine for you know health and performance and a lot of you know had a lot of body issues i used to be pretty overweight i mean i'm five three and three quarters and was roughly 175 pounds 
So when I started CrossFit in 2007, I was 120 pounds and now I'm 140 pounds. So I've actually gained 20 pounds doing CrossFit. <laughs> I'm assuming those pounds are in all the right places. Uh, I think they are. I think they are. <laughs> and whether anybody else thinks so, I really could give crap less. So <laughs> that's all that matters, I guess. It, it's it's awesome. It's your body and you're taking control of your biology. And it's you know it, it's yours to make it how you want it. And I... I think it's awesome to have people on the show who have just stood up and said, look, that's how I want it. And honestly, I don't care if, if that means, you know, weird piercings in your ears, like, <laughs> or some other weird thing. Like, if that's how you wanted it, good for you for making it that way. And uh, I'm guessing because all the all the people I know who do CrossFit kind of have a look like they could kick your ass and break you in two. <laughs> so I'm guessing from what I've seen, you're pretty darn muscular and you like it that way. Yeah, I mean, I I'm... I think I would consider myself a strong woman. And as far as I'm concerned, my physical appearance is just a manifestation of the strong person that I am on the inside. So it's appropriate, I guess, if you're not, if you're someone who is not going to relate or be comfortable dealing with a strong woman, then you, you probably will be turned off by my appearance. So I guess, you know, the right types of people are going to gravitate towards so Maybe I, subconsciously that body type. I saw a cool bumper sticker the other day that said "Strong is the new skinny." Ugh. Do you what? What do you <laughs> think about that? I mean, like, like you know, I I've never found skinny to be particularly attractive, but that's a slippery slope, Dave. <laughs> there's, it's so funny because there's there seem to be these two cancels. Like half the people are like, "Yeah, strong is the new skinny." squat if you don't have muscle you're a loser and then right. the other half of the camp is like strong is not the new skinny you just are the shape that you are and you know it's kind of very <laughs> this defensive like which i I, don't... I i like the voices of both sides that you have that's all oh, right <laughs> <laughs> well you have to distinguish one from the other it's important but i you know i don't what does that even mean strong is the new skinny i, uh, I, I, I guess think... that would be like Skinny is the thing that everybody wants to be, and not strong is the thing everybody yeah, wants that, to be. Yeah, it, it, that was how I read it. Was was that you know there's been this like uber thin look that's supposed to have been sexy, like the gaunt, starved look uh, that comes from the modeling industry because the camera adds pounds. And this um, this was on the back of a. Uh, um, some kind of like four wheel drive truck with kayak racks on top driven by a woman who obviously <laughs> did CrossFit. Um, right. And so it, she, she was basically like giving a middle finger to the Barbie culture. And, and I'm yeah. like, okay, I can respect that. Yeah. Choices. You know, everybody wants different things in life, don't they? If you want to be a skinny, helpless, weak, frail, wafy thing who, <laughs> you know, you need a man to lean on as you walk down the side. Well, I, what, I, yeah, I don't know. I, there's probably a little bit of feminism in me, just a little bit. <laughs> Tell us how you really <laughs> feel. <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, well, I probably shouldn't talk trash about celebrities, but there's one celebrity in particular who it prescribes to like this super low cow like vegan diet and her she and her trainer have a workout video where they tell women they should never lift more than three pounds and i'm like really you <laughs> i think your baby weighs more than three pounds so unless you're paying someone to pick up the baby which probably she is like i'm offended by that well, really yeah. three pounds three pounds and not only that i my first book the better baby book is about fertility and pregnancy health and building strong babies and a vegan woman who lifts only three pound weights is simply not biologically equipped to have super healthy offspring. And there are enough recovering vegans in the Bulletproof forums and on paleo in general, uh, where heck my own experience as a raw vegan, like, man, uh, it did not improve my health. Um, I, I did get a brief burst of really good stuff from it, but after that I got some autoimmunity. So yep. I, it makes me sad to hear those things, and I'm happy to see it rejected. But you're probably towards the more of the strong, like physically strong looking side of things, and you live in the South. Like, like how do people respond to you? Do you do you get treated differently because you're in really good shape? That's a good question. I don't know. I, I, hmm, I kind of think of myself as this uh, big ball of energy, and I don't really. I guess I don't wait for people to relate to me. I kind of come at them 
Um, a lot of people tell me they're intimidated by me and even men tell me I, I, because of my personality, maybe because I'm very forward, I tend to be really frank. Um, but I, you know, I try to be truthful without imparting judgmentalism at the same time. So, um, I don't know, I guess I never really consider how my physique makes other people relate to me. It has more to do with if I feel good about myself, I'm going to project that outwards and attract other people who respond to that. So I think in general, people respond pretty well. And they do get a lot of comments like, oh, do you work out? <laughs> like, <laughs> the world's uh-huh. best pickup line. <laughs> You're all, no. <laughs> I, I just crush men like you for lunch. I, like, what, what are you going to say, right? <laughs> It's, I mean, when they ask me if I work out, I just kind of laugh because, yeah. I think master no. of the obvious, right? <laughs> yeah. No, it's natural. I just woke up one day and, oh, yeah. God. It, Like, this is all butter. <laughs> I just eat butter and I look like this. It's totally natural. <laughs> too, but I will say I can relate to you because I was a vegetarian for seven years. Oh, and when, wow. I, when I first decided I'm going to go try to qualify for the CrossFit Games, I was like, I got to do this thing the whole way and so i started the the paleo diet back in 2009 i guess but no it would have been 2008 because that's when i decided i'm going to train for 2009 which is the first year that they had regionals and you had to qualify um so and i had dabbled in like um raw vegan Uh, i did a work study at the living foods institute here in atlanta with brenda cobb i don't know if you know her if you were a vegan Mm -hmm. raw vegan for a while you might know who she is but she, um, so I learned, you know, you're only supposed to eat things that aren't cooked. And I, I did, I got really skinny, but I never really felt awesome. So yeah. I, my physique changed pretty dramatically when I went on, I mean, it, paleo. I mean, it's really eating meat and vegetables, right? That's, that's a pretty natural thing. Yeah. So. <laughs> so what do you, I mean, what do you recommend people do? I mean, you run a, a CrossFit gym or a crossfit box and you have clients who come through you have you know men you have women uh they have to ask you how to eat because eating is so integrally tied with training what do you usually tell them you know what what i have found is that crossfit can be pretty overwhelming to people it tends to be an intimidating kind of program to get people started on and they come in with this mentality that you know, if I exercise enough, I can eat whatever I want. Uh, so, not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And those of us who have been at this for a really long time, like we know how true that euphemism is. You are what you eat. Like that's you're, you're building your body on the fuel that you feed it every day. You know, in the kitchen. That's a very true statement. Like I would say, your physique is oh. Over ninety percent what you what your intake is. Yeah. Um, so when they first come in, I don't. I think throwing the diet at them, and I hesitate to call it a diet. To me, it's just the way that I eat now. Um, yeah. You know, I, when I throw that at them right off, they kind of get overwhelmed. So what ends up happening is, you know, we get them focused on their performance in the gym. Um, which works really well because we have the whiteboard. It kind of keeps track of like who got the best score of the day or, you know, did you do better on this workout than you did the last time we did it? And so somehow getting them away from being obsessed with what they're eating and burning calories and getting them focused on performance kind of frees up this energy so that then they're like, God, how can I perform better? Then we're like, bam, you have to eat. Like, here's what you need to eat. And they're more receptive to it because now it's more than just, you know, I'm trying to get my body to look a certain way. Now it's, you know, it means something performance wise as well. So so that's kind of a double whammy and it will make them more receptive to kind of changing what they, you know, people get addicted to the way that they eat and they lean on it and it's a crutch and I know as well as anyone. So so th- that makes great sense. You're, you're sort of coaching them in that direction, telling them that if you don't eat, you won't perform. And if you don't eat, or say if you don't eat right, you won't perform. And if you don't eat right, um, you probably won't look good either. So you're sort of tying those two things together so people get it. 
And does yeah. it work? I mean, you're in a part of the world where obesity, at least part of the U.S., where obesity is is higher on average than um, than like the West or the East Coast. So, do you deal with a lot of people who come in like I want to do CrossFit and I weigh 300 pounds? Oh yeah. And yeah, we've well, had multiple people uh, at our gym alone that have lost over 100 pounds. They're in the triple digits of weight loss. So that's so and awesome. We, <laughs> Talk about life. We had changing. one girl that actually didn't break through. She had kind of plateaued at 200 pounds, but was obsessed with getting below 200 pounds. And we made her bring us her scale. So it, like, it lives at the gym now. She's not allowed to weigh herself. <laughs> and it wasn't until she did that, that she broke through the plateau. And now she's under 200 and has stayed there and continued to, you know, become a better shape. But it just, it's so easy to get focused on that number that really doesn't mean anything. It's just kind of messed up. The the biggest thing it means is, um, did you poop? <laughs> <laughs> like, sorry. <laughs> no, hey, that's that's true. <laughs> like, and and are you drinking enough water? Uh, and are you inflamed? Uh, and and you've probably seen the study that says if you check your weight every day, you lose less weight. Oh my god! Yeah, there's actually I, a study like that. Checking daily doesn't help you do it. You know. I've, Michelle Kenny is a friend of mine. She's another CrossFit Games competitor. And she, some friends of mine have one of your competitor podcasts, the Barbell Shrug. Cool. Um, she, I was listening to her podcast with them the other day. And she was saying, you know, I got on the scale the other day and I weigh 142 pounds. And I freaked out because I'm still a girl and I still have this, oh, my God, I'm good. Like, because the scale says <laughs> a certain thing, I'm fat. And you look at her and she's ripped. Like you can see every muscle striation. It's so, and she knows, like logically she knows that, but there's still something about that number that in her brain is connected to, uh, 140 means, you know, I'm, I'm overweight because it, it means no one will love me. Right. I mean, that's, <laughs> like, that's bad. <laughs> yeah. Or someone's going to judge you for looking a certain way or going to, you know, yeah. Yeah. I, I certainly felt that way when I was 300 pounds and I'm like, I, I felt you know, unworthy, honestly. And you're like, like, you feel like you're lazy and like, it's your fault and, and kind of embarrassed by it. And I mean, I was doing everything I could, it just wouldn't come off because I had all the wrong data. And that's one of the reasons that, that I write the stuff I write is just like, if someone had just told me I would have done anything on earth, uh, right. but it's annoying to me that I had to do so many different random things before I hit on what worked and made it repeatable. Totally. And it's, it can be frustrating as a trainer too, that the conventional messages, the traditional ones that people are getting the most often are the ones that are the most messed up. Like when I first started eating the paleo diet, my dad was like, but the doctors say you need to eat grains. And I was like, I've, I've been one of the 50 fittest women on earth two years in a row now that like, I think I'm doing all right. But, you know, like, and, and you're like the doctors. But that's what they say. The doctor's <laughs> fat. Don't look right. I know, but, but it's so like it's so upsetting. And the, oh my, don't even get me started on the food pyramid. <laughs> I, I actually started a website once uh, right after they came out. With Choose my plate. I, I came up with lose my plate, <laughs> and I was like, "Here's what's wrong with it." And I don't think it's still up. It was just like a little dorky site, but it, it was like, "Like, you know, let's fix the plate and just rearrange it entirely, where it's like fat." And all of a sudden, then people feel better. Yeah. So you've you've gotten past that, and uh, okay, have you gotten your dad to try bulletproof coffee? Oh my gosh. Well, I, <laughs> that's always the hardest one. My dad and I are not, he's not going to do anything that is my idea. Uh. So <laughs> I'm not even going to try. Like if he hears about it and he does it one day, like that's cool. But he's, he's like a cat. He does what he wants. And <laughs> it's I, just going to be that way. It's okay. <laughs> I, I totally get it. Uh, and I know that you drink Bulletproof coffee because um, I send it to you. Uh, do you use it before a workout? Like, how do you time your coffee intake? Uh, nice mug there. If if you're hearing this in your car, there's a bulletproof coffee mug that randomly appeared inside the, the frame. <laughs> Random or not? Oh. No. <laughs> um, no. So that's I love that question because I think what I do for fuel is a lot different than what a lot of athletes in particular do for fuel. And understand that I have experimented with this stuff for me personally for the last 
15 years. I've been playing around with diet, nutrition, and performance. And uh, so I do. I mean, Bulletproof Coffee is pretty much my breakfast. So I have um, grass-fed butter. There's also some coconut cream in there to make it just a little bit lighter. Oh, yeah. Um, I like coconut cream in there. It's good. Yeah, and I just started to drizzle the um, brain octane. Um, that was in my January package. Hey, do, you, do you feel the difference between the old upgraded MCT and the brain octane? I don't know. I don't know. I have to be honest. But now I've only tried it for, I mean, I've only been on it for like two weeks now. Okay. Um, and I didn't use MCT oil really before that. Oh, so, so. Then, then you're not going to feel the difference between the two. Most people, I'd say like, eight out of ten are like whoa different and other people are like i have i don't feel anything so hey it, yeah but my it, breakfast for a really long time has been either pure protein and fat or now it's mostly fat but occasionally if i know i'm gonna have some time between when i drink the coffee and when i work out i'll have some protein so almost pure protein did you see my post about uh women and intermittent fasting by any chance uh, no, I didn't, but I have played around with that a little bit, and I've played around even more with um, ketogenic diet. Yep. Um, and I can also give you some feedback about that. Yeah, I, okay, I want to do that, but first, it looks like it got dark and the light we yeah, have from the window. I, you might want to turn on that overhead light, even if we get some glare, that way people can see you, because you suddenly got like super Elvira. Yeah, because it's like 6 o'clock here now. Yeah, it's, it's getting dark. Why don't you just hop up and turn on the overhead that we had on earlier? Um, okay. That way people can see you. In the meantime, if you're listening in your car, um, we had really nice natural light, and now we have some interior light, but at least you can see the joys of doing podcasts from home. Is that better? Yeah, much better. You're back. We've got a little bit of glare, but people can see your cool blue hair now, so it's totally <laughs> legit. All right, so so you were going to talk about ketosis, because women have a different experience of ketosis uh, than men do. What's your take on you know being in full-blown ketosis? Well, women do and also athletes do. Mm -hmm. So what I, you know, being someone who got into exercise and nutrition because I was overweight, I still think I have a little bit of obsession with, oh my God, I have to be skinny or not skinny, but I want to be lean, you know, like I don't want any fat on my body anywhere. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not necessarily the best thing for performance. And so, yeah. um, I basically consumed less than 50 grams of carbs a day for over six months. Uh, occasionally carb load, but I can go into ketosis really easily. And I don't know if that's an experience that other women have had, but um, what I've found works really well for me is to do a version of intermittent fasting where I have almost only protein and fat before I work out. And normally I work out somewhere between 11 a.m. Eh, usually I'm wrapped up by 5.30 p.m. So I don't have any carbs until after I work out. That's such a smart strategy, but you're still eating some carbs. Yet yeah, now I am. But uh, when I was trying to stay on the ketogenic diet, basically, I got really depressed. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, was having some other health i mean the depression got really awful i was moody and cranky all the time my performance in the gym obviously went down did, and did, an interesting did you get PMS? Sense, um i don't remember but probably okay and failing memory for sure no, <laughs> <laughs> that could be my old age Dave. <laughs> okay <laughs> so, um but the notable thing to me was that i wasn't skinny you know, I wasn't as lean as I wanted to be. And that's what I was expecting. Uh, but you were I, getting inflammation from the protein, probably. Yeah, that's possible. Because I was still eating vegetables, but they're like the thermogenic vegetables, which are like zero net carbs. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Everyone right now is hearing like blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but no, I reached out to Rob Wolf because he's someone that I've just been – an associate or not associate acquaintance of for um quite a few years yeah, he, he's awesome we we hung out at paleo fx and uh, we've emailed back and forth for a while on coffee and stuff like that i mean he's, he, what what he's a legit. 
I can I could right now send him a message and he would respond to me like that, which to me that's awesome. He's so down to earth, but he was like, um, yeah, you might want to think about eating some carbs. Mm-hmm. You don't have. <laughs> yeah, I added carbs back in. It's just been play, playing around with what. So you'll probably like this too. Um, so right after I work out, I have some protein and as a starch to add to the protein shake. Um, I started using raw potato starch. Is, um, is it working for you? Because I'm doing some testing on that myself. Uh, what's your experience of resistant starch or raw potato starch? Well, raw so, potato flour, yeah. So far, I like it. I've just started this like the last couple of weeks. But before that, I have tried various other forms of starches um, post-workout. And like, I'm allergic to corn. Mm-hmm. Like, not... I think I react worse to corn than to gluten, which I don't. Wow. I, I think it's a fairly more common allergy than people know, but corn is in everything. Yes. So the waxy maize stuff like didn't work for me. Mm-hmm. And then there was another, um, another company called three fuel makes a super quality product, but their starch source comes from waxy maize. And so I tried it and I was like, mm, I don't know if I'm really driving with this so much. So, um, but so far so good. Yeah. Excellent. I I tried first potato, but I'm nightshade sensitive, so I did potato for a couple of days, and of course, predictably rashes. And then I switched to plantain starch, raw plantain, uh, which is one of the higher resistant starch things, and eventually you can. And what I found was was mostly gas and hives. Like it it totally didn't work for me. And plantain starch. Yeah, just from any of the resistant starches. Um, hmm. And I I think. I wrote about this in the first write-up. I have another one coming about that, that it depends on what's in your gut. Like it's going to cause a flare-up of whatever lives there in in your colon. And um, even one of the guys who's a primary experimenter with resistant starch, he's like, oh, look, in my genetic profile of my poop, I have (laughs) this, you know, I have this funny bacteria that normally is only found like on glaciers. I'm like, do you really want like, stuff in your gut from a glacier maybe it's good maybe it's not but uh, i don't know given that i have used to have fat people bacteria in my gut i i don't know like maybe i need a fecal transplant or something but like i don't know I'm assuming that the, the the knowledge that he has about his own poop means he has to collect some of his home poop on a regular basis and i think that's fantastic <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> oh, don't mess with that spoon. <laughs> no, not those dishes. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, that's bad. <laughs> then again, you have dogs. I, I, see, <laughs> I see dogs roaming around in the background, and all dogs know that cats make Tootsie Rolls. So that's all I'm saying. Oh, <laughs> I was a vet tech for a really long time, so I'm oh. pretty sure if it's come out of a dog's orifice, it's been in my mouth. Ew. I'm just saying, cats. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you, you might have just reduced your kissability with that statement. <laughs> People are like, oh, i got to turn this podcast off. <laughs> like, what is she talking about? That, that's a whole new record on, on the podcast. Like, we're, we're almost to 100 episodes, and this is the first time that's come up. <laughs> <laughs> the poop spoon? Okay. <laughs> hey, Super you fun. heard it here first. I invented the poop spoon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every time I go to a friend's house now, especially like the biohacker people I hang with, I'm going to be like looking at the spoon funny going, like, was this the one? <laughs> <laughs> now, if well, stir your coffee with that. <laughs> <laughs> now, the funny thing is, if, if you're not watching this, I said that right as you were taking a drink, uh, Shana, <laughs> of Bulletproof Coffee. I thought you were going to spit Bulletproof Coffee on your computer. That would also be the first for a podcast. So I'm, I'm glad that didn't happen. Wow. All right. Cool. Right, I've got to ask you one more question, and this is something, it, it, it's a real question. JJ Virgin, uh, who's a good friend, author of The Virgin Diet, and really an expert in food sensitivity, um, she's been telling me I need to make her a Bulletproof Babe t-shirt. She's like totally used Bulletproof Coffee to recover from a, a surgery, not just coffee, but Bulletproof, the whole products, collagen and all that, to recover from a surgery. And uh, she says she wants a Bulletproof Babe t-shirt. And I'm trying to figure out, should I actually make Bulletproof Babe t-shirts? Like, Or is that like would, sexist? Would, is that something you'd wear? I would wear it, yeah. yeah. Well, especially if it was a tank top. Okay. You, yeah. you CrossFit I, women in tank tops. What is it? I, I, I hear you. <laughs> I 
we work hard for our guns and we want you to see them. <laughs> exactly. All right. Tank top. All right. I, I'm hearing it. We're going to have to do that. And JJ, uh, she's not a CrossFitter, but she has arms that make Michelle Obama sort of feel weak. So okay. same sort of thing. Like, like women with arms always want tank tops. And if you're doing CrossFit, you're going to have arms. I, I hear you. So, so speaking of women and tank tops, what's your take on CrossFit when women are pregnant? Um, I'm fine with it as long as you don't take a picture of yourself in a sports bra doing an overhead squat and then post it on the internet somewhere because it's really obnoxious to me. Like, I hate that, that like, I'm a pregnant woman doing CrossFit, so I'm going to take a photo in a sports bra and put it on the internet. It's just, ah. <laughs> you, don't, you don't like the round tummy look, huh? I, I get it. Like, there's a, a pretty strong foundation in, you know, human performance and focus and energy and drive and all that. And you, you don't need to add controversy on top of it, but it is, yeah. a, the, I mean, the whole kind of CrossFit brand is a little bit like in your face and confrontational in a, you know, not in a, in a negative way, but just kind of like, you know, I, I can kick ass. Can you kind of perspective? Well, so, so the, <clears throat> what could, what could a person do to, to find like a quality CrossFit gym to go to? Like if, if I was brand new to CrossFit and I wanted to find a place to go, what's the process I should go through to like vet people to understand like that they can meet my needs? Well, you know, that's, that's a challenge too, because I think it's people naturally are going to look at CrossFit. They're going to see, Oh, this is CrossFit Decatur. This is CrossFit East Decatur. They must be the same thing. Just location is the only thing that's different. But in reality, we're only, affiliates we're not franchises so as long as like i pay my dues and stay in good standing with hq <clears throat> i can pretty much i could run zumba classes and call myself crossfit if i wanted to so my advice to someone who's looking for a crossfit gym is go like talk to the trainers there what is the environment like you know how much experience do the trainers have um, talk to the other clients. What has their experience been like? Um, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of my staff and the fact that all of the trainers at my gym have been coaching some form of sport or exercise for five years or more. Um, and you're not going to get that at every CrossFit gym. So, so, so you want to look at the experience of the people there. And, and that's really important because a lot of people who listen to the Bulletproof Executive Radio, they're not CrossFitters. There are a ton of people who are CrossFitters <laughs> who are. Uh, who do listen to it and for those of us who or those of, of them who are not crossfitters are i'm sure that they've thought about doing it and i'm i know that i with the amount i sleep and the amount of stress in my life just creating content and all the things i'm working on uh, to make happen uh, i don't think i would recover enough if i worked out six or seven days a week like in fact i know for sure i wouldn't but i love the intensity that that crossfit brings like that is exactly how to exercise but you know as uh was it uh amanda allen was saying on a, on another podcast um she's a like a world champion crossfitter um from was, australia yeah yeah from australia she was saying like i you know i have to recover like a professional and i'm like i don't have that much recovery time built into my day so i'm i'm concerned that i would just not stick together if i did well, what you do so I, I, but I you but you wouldn't be doing what she does. Oh God, no! Um, if I because, was on her schedule, it would kick my ass. It, it would. Yeah, and me there's up. no, way. there's no way. And yeah. and even even our athletes that are wanting to compete on a local level, a very mm -hmm. small scale, we're like, if, if that's your goal, you just need to be doing the workout of the day mm -hmm. every single day. We're closed on Sunday, so you would be doing six on, one off. Um, and our coaches have the experience and the knowledge to help you scale for what is going to work best for you. Like that's what the coaches are there yeah. for to give you that guidance. But you know, someone like Amanda Allen um, or myself training to compete at that, you know, the elitist level of the sport, you know, we're doing sometimes four and five workouts a day, five to six days a week. And then I've heard that there are <laughs> CrossFit athletes that don't take any rest days, which wow. I cannot fathom. I mean, I'm, I'm 37 now and I can't, you know, I don't want to use my age as any type of mental limitation because honestly, if we're using linear thinking and evidence-based uh, proof, 
I am the oldest I've ever been right now, and I'm the fittest that I've ever yeah. been. So I can't really use age as like, oh, you know, it's it's some illness. It just came upon me suddenly when I hit 34 years old. You know, like I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to fall into that trap. But the reality is that I don't have all the enzymes that I used to have when I was younger, and I do have to pay extra special attention to my diet, to my sleep, how much stress is in my life. Um, but just for the average person, you know, you're coming in doing one workout a day. I think you could totally, totally recover. Cool. I de definitely. <clears throat> so then there's a question. I'm just watching the clock here. Make sure we, we get our podcast done in time. It's a question. I that, told you I could talk a lot. I told you. I you, know, you. <laughs> you. You did warn me and you were totally right about it. No, uh, I've actually appreciated your comments a lot. And this is the question that I always ask on the podcast. The one about your top three recommendations for people who want to perform better in every way, not just in a gym or anywhere else, but just what have you learned in your life? The three most important things that other people who kick ass should learn. Thought you might ask me this. <laughs> <laughs> um, no looking at your notes. No, okay. <laughs> no uh, I, I mean, number one, and this is going to sound totally obvious, like, duh, but exercise is I used to be really horribly depressed. I mean, suffered from depression from the time I was a small child. I mean, my mother tells me stories about coming home from, you know, second grade and being very sad and not knowing what was wrong. Um, but when I started exercising, my mood changed. And I think there is something very empowering and self-satisfying about working out. Um, and there's really not that many things that empower people particularly women in this day and age um and it's just so it's so obvious i am stronger i just lifted this weight yes i am powerful and that feeling of empowerment can carry throughout the rest of your life not just what you do in the gym um so that's number one is exercise is really important and then it doesn't you know you don't have to do crossfit you can if zumba works for you go for it, it you know walking, any, any type of activity that makes you feel good and empowers you. Um, number two, I would say, um, never settle. Don't settle for anything. If, if things are good now, they could be great. If things are great now, what if they could be awesome? If things are awesome right now, what, what is that next level going to feel like? You know, I don't think it's, I think it's always okay to reach for that next level. Always be trying to accomplish more. Um, and something that's been really important for me and more of a challenge for me, and this would be my third thing, is that you have to find things to celebrate all the time. It's really easy to focus on the negative and the things that get you down in life, but... Um, I have found that looking for the little ways that I win on a daily basis are what keep me coming back, um, keep me motivated, keep my energy up, um, make me be an acceptable person to be around. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, those are my three. Awesome. I... If I had a fourth, I would say dye your hair and find your inner superhero. Nice. I, I tried that once and it didn't last very long. <laughs> no. Did you have like a mohawk? No. I, when I was in Tibet, I was like, you know what? No one gives a crap what my hair looks like. And, and this is like 10 years ago. But so I just shaved it. So I'm like, there's no water in Tibet. In order to wash yourself, you get like a little wash basin every two days outside a guest house. And you're like trying to, I'm like, who wants hair in that environment? Oh, man. So I think I went like 25 days without a shower. Uh, so I was like, all right. And then my hair grew back. It was like only the stubble. And I went into this, I was like, I'm just going to look crazy because I have no job. I've been in Silicon Valley for all this time. So I bleached my hair like completely as light as it would go. And it was only like, I don't know, maybe an inch long. So there's a few photos of me floating around with like this bright, like super <laughs> blonde hair. And I, I thought it was kind of hilarious. And it was, it was a fun experiment because I don't know, I, if you work in, in a corporate environment, which I've done for most of my life, like you just don't get to do stuff like that, even in Silicon Valley, unless you're, you know, some programmer or something, it generally doesn't fly. Uh, so <laughs> it, 
it was kind of like liberating just people look at you the same and it doesn't really matter like you're you're kind of obsessed with your own image and then you don't mm -hmm. but good I, I like your blue that was a much better color than bleached <laughs> yeah well it started out pink actually i used to play music for a living and that kind of how the pink started and then when i stopped playing music everyone was like you're never going to get a job but i always got a job so that's hogwash. <laughs> well, that, and now you don't have to have a job. You're, you know, you're running a CrossFit uh, box. <laughs> Speaking of that, why don't you tell people how they can find out more about you and how they can get in touch with your super awesome CrossFit facility? Um, our CrossFit gym, <clears throat> it's CrossFitEastDecatur.com. Um, maybe easier to just go at Shana Alverson on Twitter um, because the link is there on my Twitter profile. Um, I'm at Shana underscore a on Instagram and I'm on Facebook. I'm like a social media whore. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I just please, enjoy it. Please so. everybody like me. No, <laughs> I, I will make sure to include Follow me on Twitter. <laughs> I'll include links to all of those on the show notes so people can find you. Uh, oh. it, it's really cool uh, having a chance to talk to someone who's, you know, super elite fitness, but also like you're running, uh, running a, a gym and that, that you just have a different perspective because you see a lot of people come through and lose a hundred pounds. And I appreciate you sharing that. <laughs> you got it. Thanks for having me. Have an awesome day. <laughs> you too. I think, I think the thing to think about is just what you, what you mentioned just now, which is we are a part of that system. And once you start to think of yourself as part of that system, then it all shifts and that can help guide your decisions. So if you know that food has been grown on healthy soil or uh, according to healthy practices, that food is going to be more healthy for you. It's actually really, really hard to do that. What I just did was I worked on training my interstitials, on training all of the muscles involved in making your lungs pull air in and force air out.